What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, that is here to congratulate you for finding this video that will undoubtedly bring- undoubtedly- what? Anyways, a uh, video that will for sure bring you joy because it is r slash bro revenge and that- and people like it. I like it. Alright, this story's called, AT&T tries to screw me over $139. I actually screwed them out of $72,000. After my wife and I got married last year, congratulations, we decided that we should both get on the same phone plan. We went down to the AT&T store and met with a rep who told us we'd both be on an unlimited plan for $70 a month all in, including taxes and fees. I was very specific about getting the all in price for the service. It seemed like a decent deal, so we signed up. Two days later, I log into the website and see that there's already a bill for $139. I call up a rep to see what's up and they tell me that's between the activation fees, taxes, and surcharges. The bill was correct. I told them what the salesperson told me and they basically told me to pound sand. I promptly told them I wanted to cancel the service and want the $139 waived. They said they could cancel the service, but could not or would not waive the bill. They also told me if I canceled immediately, my wife and I would lose our phone numbers, which is true. So I figured since I already have to pay for the month and I don't want to lose my phone number, I'll just get a new carrier and cancel when I'm ready. So I do my research and find Visible, which is excellent, and we make the switch. I call back to AT&T and inform them that we have switched carriers and want to cancel the service. I ask for a refund. The rep informs me that since I have had the service for four days, that I am not entitled to a refund. He tells me to read the fine print on the contract, which indeed tells me that I have three days to cancel for a full refund. I'm now fuming because the first customer service representative that I talked to on day two denied me a refund if I canceled. I ask for the next level of customer service representative, and they send me to a customer care and retention person. I explain the entire fiasco to him, and how I feel that I have now been lied to twice by AT&T reps, sales rep, and first CSR. He is a really cool guy and apologizes and says he'll take care of it and will completely waive the bill. I am very thankful and hang up, thinking that this is finally resolved. Fast forward a month and I get an AT&T bill in the mail saying my payment was not received and is now late. I again pick up the phone and call AT&T. I eventually make my way through two CSR reps until I get back to the customer care and retention department. This time I did not have the chill dude. Instead, I got a very swarmy woman who said that the bill was due and I'd owe the entire amount. I asked her to please check the CSR notes and that the last guy told me he would waive the amount. She put me on a 10 minute silent hold and came back and said she'd escalate the matter to her supervisor. She said I should receive an email by the end of the week with a resolution. Two weeks go by, no response. I call again. This time I get a very nice lady that is sympathetic. She says she'll waive the bill. She comes back and tells me that she can't do anything because the bill has already been sent to collections. She said not to worry and that she'll send a letter to collections to have them waive the debt. I ask if this will go on my credit report and she says no, that they'll take care of it. Six months later, I get a letter in the mail from Sequium Asset Solutions out of Georgia trying to collect on the $139. I immediately send them a letter via certified mail demanding that they verify the debt, since it's obviously bad. I hear nothing for two months, and then I get an alert that I have a negative mark on my credit. I go in, and sure enough, Sequium has indicated that the amount is in collections. I immediately write letters to all three bureaus requesting that they remove the mark. A month goes by, and every single one of the bureaus remove the mark. Thank God! Another three months go by, and then I get a letter from Sunrise Credit Services in New York, again trying to collect on the debt. This is truly unbelievable because it appears that Sequium couldn't verify it. So instead of apologizing and waiving the debt, they just sold it off to another collection agency. I send another certified letter to Sunrise demanding verification. I get nothing in reply. 
So far, they have not attempted to put a mark on my credit. That's where this part of the story ends. Who knows what will happen next? I could file a lawsuit, but the filing fee alone would be more than the amount owed. Here's the thing. I am not cash-strapped. I am blessed enough that I could easily pay the $139 without making a dent in my budget. I have lost five times the amount in hours spent on the phone in writing letters. But I am determined to get the mat with AT&T on principle alone. This brings me to the revenge stage. You see, in addition to my day job as an attorney, I am an elected city councilman in my town, and when I was going over our monthly expenses, I noticed that we were paying AT&T close to $6,000 a month for our phones, internet, and TV services. We're a fairly small town, so it was pretty obvious that we were being bent over by these clowns and that we could save a ton of money by switching. I started working with our city manager and IT director on finding other solutions. We discovered that by switching to various carriers and providers that we could save half. I never would have looked that closely into our telecom expense had AT&T not jerked me around. Two weeks ago, the resolution to switch was put on our meeting agenda and the council voted to pass it. We decided to completely cut ties with AT&T. Our city is saving a ton of money, getting better service, and with the money that we saved from switching, we were able to hire another part-time animal shelter employee, which we desperately needed. I highly doubt our city would have considered switching if I didn't make such a stink about it. AT&T will end up losing hundreds of thousands of dollars over the coming years because of this. I hope it was worth it, AT&T! Was it worth it, AT&T? You see, I've got a beef with AT&T. I'm gonna stop saying their name so much. But I bought the glorious Galaxy S25 G expensive but really good phone. I had the S9 before that and it was not that good. And the S7 Edge was even worse. I hate that phone so much. Anyways, I don't even get 5G access. How stupid is that? Even though all the people are saying, don't get 5G phones yet. It's new and I want it. I don't care. <laughs> Anyways, AT&T sucks. Um, and this guy did some damage to them. Holy, holy poon. Alright guys, this story's called Tetsuro! This happened many, many moons ago. I can't say it's pro-revenge, but for a fourth grader, it's epic. We had a homeroom in school. The room you started your day in, the one where you kept your stuff, like school supplies and, most importantly, our lunch. So, beginning of the day, we leave everything in the desk, which is where we were told to keep everything. Class ends, I pick up the needed school supplies and book for the next couple of classes, plus PE. A few classes later, we go back to homeroom where we have a class, then we break for lunch period. One day, I went to get my lunch and half of it was gone, putting a few pieces of candy. I told my teacher that someone had stolen part of my lunch. She assured me no one had taken my food. I explained that yes, my food is missing. She still said no one took my food. I couldn't understand why she wasn't comprehending what I was saying. I'm right next to her desk telling her. She said lunch is about to begin and to go set down before the bell rings. I said I will, but first I need you to understand what I'm saying. Someone has taken my lunch. Again, she said I was mistaken. I said I don't understand why you can't just investigate what happened. Now it's getting real. She said it's lunchtime and I needed to go to the cafeteria. I said why? Someone ate my lunch! I have nothing to eat! She told me if I didn't leave, she would take me to the principal's office. I said great, let's go because I'm not leaving until you do something. She said okay, I'll do something. I said great, thanks. What are you going to do? She said she didn't have time to deal with me, so I left. Next day, I was missing another treat for my lunch. Now, understand, I'm poor. That meal is all I have. My mom and dad are pieces of crap on drugs, so I make my own lunch, which tends to be a jelly sandwich if we have it, and candy from Halloween or something. This particular week, my brother and I scored on pudding, and I had yet to eat any, because some little jerk absconded with my stuff. So I brought this up to my teach, and again, she didn't want to hear about it. So I went to the principal's office during lunchtime to file whatever grievance a fourth grader could do. At least the principal heard what I had to say. Monday morning came, and my teacher was pissed I went to the principal. She scolds me in front of the other students, saying I'm a tattletale. 
No one likes a narc. Ha <laughs> ha. Not cool. I just sat there and said nothing. When I got home, I told my mom and dad. Their solution was for me to take my lunch with me. I did think about that, but I didn't because it was a hassle to carry everything. Plus, to put it in a safe place. One class was PE, physical education. That's just not right, so I didn't. Their idea sucked. My idea was genius. I had a big Tootsie Roll, like the size of an adult's finger. They are so good. I hate to ruin it, but what a great cause. So I took my dad's drill motor, chucked up a large size drill, and bored out enough of the Tootsie Roll to load it with 5W transmission fluid. I capped it with the shavings that I bored out, wrapped it back up, and my trap was set. It looked great. Tootsie Rolls are only a little oily on the outside because of the heat or the makeup of the candy itself. I was so proud of myself for the craftsmanship I used for the devious idea. This was going to work. I didn't tell anyone of my plan, not my mom and dad or my little brother. In the back of my head, I kept thinking, who is doing this? My brother? My teacher? She hated me. I was a smart kid, always did my stuff, but with an attitude. I looked like a hippie, bell bottom, ZZ top t-shirt. Not proper for rednecks in Oklahoma, but I just didn't know. I soon found out what period my food was being taken and by whom. It was this ginger kid, fat tub of crap who was related to, of all people, my teacher. How? I can't remember, but they were kin. I was taken to the principal's office. I'm thinking I'm getting an award for finding a thief. Nope, I'm getting yelled at. It took me a second to comprehend I was being reprimanded. I had enough of adults pushing me around, making me feel like the bad guy. I explained to both of them that I didn't give Fat Ginger permission to eat my food. Why is he sick? Did he eat something that wasn't his? Did anyone think that stealing someone's food is wrong? But I'm the bad guy. I hate to tell you, but Ginger is going to die. I put cyanide in the food from rat poison. He had already been taken to the nurse office. Principal and teacher started to freak out. I started laughing, said it was only transmission fluid. They were going to give me paddling. I explained that was never going to happen. My mom and dad have to be present. So let's get them here and see if they agree with me, the victim, or you who didn't listen or do anything to protect me. My mom might be a lot of things, but when it comes to her kid being bullied, she went off on them. I was in the outer office hearing her go off on them. When she came out, I asked her if I was the winner. She said, yes, baby, you showed them. You're the winner. Wow. Okay, so I used to live in rural Oklahoma, so this was bringing back some weird feelings. But I really like this story. Um, just gave me secondhand nostalgia for uh, for probably not that great of a time for this person but i don't know i just kind of read this like a junie b jones story or something and i love junie b jones just childhood mischief with you know really sad sad stuff as well but really great story i had a blast reading it hope you guys enjoyed it too i'm of the opinion that if you want to poison your food and if someone steals it and gets poisoned that's their fault man what if i'm trying to kill a rat with it now you're the rat because you ate it, you you thieving little food thief, you. All right, this story's called, get your ears ready, Height Approved! I originally posted this in r slash malicious compliance, but I think it belongs here too. This isn't my story, but my parents. It was probably the first time I witnessed malicious compliance and I still remember it well. It was about 25 years ago, so I was about eight and we had just moved into a 150-year-old house that was in need of major repairs. My dad, thinking ahead, knew he would need a large garage and workshop to really get started on the renovations properly. On the edge of our yard was an ancient barn that was falling apart and needed to be torn down. My dad figured this was the best place to build his new workshop, so that was the plan. We had met and were on good terms with all the neighbors at that point. When the plans for the new workshop were finished, my parents went around to all the neighbors as a courtesy to show them the plans and get their blessings. The neighbors whose property the current barn and new workshop would border, I'll call them the Peters, were concerned about the height. 
The existing barn was 16 feet high, and they asked if we could only build it one story, 12 foot max, as to not block the sun in their yard. Sure, no problem, my parents agreed. They wanted to go two stories for extra storage, but just one wasn't a deal breaker. So the old barn was torn down and the foundation laid for the new one. During that time, there was a falling out with the Peters and my parents. I'm not sure what happened, but it turned nasty. One day, my brother and I were playing street hockey and Mr. Peters came out yelling at us, Get off the road, you half-breed turds! My dad is black, so we're both half-black. You have to earn your place in this town! Upon hearing this, my mom had to physically restrain my dad from going over and beating the living crap out of him. Eventually, he cooled off and started on his plan. The plans for one story went out the window. Soon, the new garage that was only supposed to be one story soon gained a second in the blueprints. If they were going to direct racist comments at his kids, my dad would build what he wanted. As construction started, the Peters came over to ask why there was two stories being built and were told to go love themselves. We didn't hear from them again until the roof started to go on. The bylaws of the township limited all-out structures to 24 feet high. The Peters called the township and then a building inspector, claiming that the new garage was over 24 feet high. If it was over height, the entire thing would have to be torn down and rebuilt, costing us tens of thousands of dollars. I remember the Peters standing there, watching the new inspector with smug looks on their faces. Two days later, we got the final report back from the township and inspector. 23 feet, 11 inches. Just as my dad had drawn up in his new plans. He sent me up on the roof of the garage, just plywood, no shingles yet, with some spray paint and had me write 23 feet, 11 inches. Hide approved in two foot neon orange letters across the entire roof facing their yard and house. Not only did the garage block all sunlight from reaching their yard, but my dad waited until everything else was done before he shingled that side of the roof. They had to stare at those neon orange letters for almost three years. We didn't hear a peep from them for the next 10 years until they moved. Okay, so no matter what happened and who was at fault for the whole falling out thing between those two peeps, Hell, it could have been like OP's family fault, family's fault for whatever the hell happened. But that does not justify racism, especially towards parties not involved, especially when it's just children just playing in the freaking street. Anyways, revenge 100% justified. Um, really creative and funny. Great hybrid between malicious compliance, pro-revenge, and uh, petty revenge. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.